Hey guys, we're going to start off uh, with the national anthem. We have Pastor Eugene Cannon here. He was born in southwest Washington, the third son of a coal miner and a strong Christian family. Amen to that. In the 12th grade, he was ordained into the ministry. Pastor Cannon is currently a part of the Ephesians 4 network. E4N is a Christ-centered, charismatic, multicultural IPHC network of network of uh, ministers, churches, and ministries dedicated to fulfilling the Great Commission. Let's hear it for Pastor Eugene Kennett. Please stand. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming and the Okay, uh, we're going to open up with a prayer. Uh, Pastor Matthew Guedes, can you come up here? Matt Guedes is Executive Director of Camp Freedom, a nonprofit organization that helps disabled veterans and first responders through outdoor activities including hunting, fishing, and shooting sports. Let's pray. Father God, you are the originator of all freedom. You are the author of all freedom. And we want to praise you and worship you today. We pray, Lord, that you would bless everyone who has attended this event, that you would bless us abundantly, that you would sh teach us and, and show us today the things that you want us to work in, the, the things you want us to be involved in, and that we would become wise by the moment in your ways. Lord, I pray for all the speakers that you would bless them and give them a powerful message built around freedom and built around the truths of your word. And Lord, I also pray that you would bless uh, this great country once again, Lord, that you would help us to see all that is opposed to you to stand against it firmly and to stand up for the things that you call us to love the things that you call us to be a part of lord we just ask your blessing we ask your mighty hand to be upon us and we ask you to just glorify yourself in this day in jesus name amen okay how many of you guys been paying attention seeing what's going on in hong kong it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable what's going out there. I, I had the privilege. I spent nine days out there. I saw several protests. There was not one protest that I went to where I was not crying because it was unbelievable to see two million people together, united to fight against the communist regime in China. It is unbelievable. These people armed with umbrellas are willing to die for their country, for Hong Kong, their city, right? It's unbelievable. It's so inspiring. While we in America, we have a tendency to sit around and, and sleep while our government continues to sell out this country, right? It's unbelievable. The thing is, is Hong Kong, the people are protesting because they know what they're up against. They know what their future is for. And they do not want their children to have the Chinese Communist regime to be ruling over them. Can I get an amen? amen. This is why the Second Amendment is so important. They have two million people in the streets and they're armed with umbrellas. Imagine if they had the Second Amendment. The, uh, China only has about 2.5 million ground troops, right? This is so important. This is why we have to fight for the Second Amendment as much as you possibly can. So that way, our children and our grandchildren, they don't have to fight tyrants with umbrellas, right? Can I get an amen? We have to help our, the youth understand this fact right here, okay? This is very important. 
The youth has to understand that the government is not here to protect us. They do not pass laws to keep us safe. They do not. They do not pass any gun laws to keep you guys safe. Is that right? If they want to keep you guys safe, why are they going after the rifle, which only, only kills about 300 people per year? One of the safest guns that you can own, and they're going after that. That's why every single time there's a mass shooting, China publicly states that our government needs to be more strict on our citizens to take away our Second Amendment right. And here's why. I'm going to tell you why, okay? If you find out, if we hear that they any, any troops okay, take one step on our country, you know that all of you guys and everybody, everybody in this country, every single patriot will be there to protect this country, to protect the women, protect the children, right? This is the thing that people don't understand is that when we, these people, these patriots, these gun owners who are willing to protect this country, if it came to that point, guess what? We're going to be out there protecting all the gun grabbers, all the liberals, all the people who've been begging to take away our guns because we fight for them too. That's a real freedom fighter. Can I get an amen? This is something that I've been going around the country and I've been, I've been trying to push this and help people understand this, okay? Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God, ladies and gentlemen. It is obedience to God. It is your moral obligation when you see evil clear as day, okay? And you say nothing and you do nothing, you will be held just as responsible as the evil itself, right? Darkness only exists in the absence of light. Only when good men shut up, sit down, and stay silent. That's the only time when evil can exist, especially in this country, because when good men and women like you guys, okay, when good men and women stand up, stand tall, and fight for what is right, evil stands no chance, ladies and gentlemen. No chance. This is what people don't understand, okay? The Christian community has been plagued. The churches have been plagued. The pastors have been plagued. Everyone's sitting down and shutting up, okay? We've been plagued to believe the whole point of being a good Christian is to keep your mouth shut. No, to just go through life. Allow these tyrants, allow the evil, keep your mouth shut, collect your donations, right? Don't sin, whatever, buy the products, watch TV, go home, go to bed, live through the exact same day, every single day, ladies and gentlemen, that is not the point. The point, the reason why Jesus sent us down here was to be warriors for Christ, to be warriors for God. We need to be fighting every single day for what is right. Ladies and gentlemen, evil doesn't sleep. There's too many injustices in this world for us to, to uh, continue to stay silent. We need to get up off of the couches, get out of the houses, get out of the couches, go out onto the streets and fight for what is right, ladies and gentlemen. Please. Um, what we have right now going on in this country, okay, we have 2020 coming up. The criminals are being exposed. There's a lot of things that are happening. Okay, you can guarantee that 2020 is going to be a very important year for the United States of America. And you need to ask yourself, how do you want to participate? How much do you want to go down in history? I'm not talking about being in the history books, right? But how much do you want to participate in one of the biggest years in the United States of America? The one thing that I tell people all the time is that one of my biggest fears I've ever had in my entire life was public speaking. Biggest fears ever, right? Guess, guess who put that fear in my heart? Satan did. Because he did not want me to discover the path that God built for me. The destiny that God laid out for me, right? He wanted me to steer off and to stay off that path, so he put that fear in my heart. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to ask you this question. You need to think about what is it that you're afraid of? What is it? Because when I faced the biggest fear of my entire life, I found my destiny, and there's no amount of gold, there's no amount of money that's worth more than that, right? Can I get an amen? amen. Fear will no longer run this country. Fear will no longer run conservatives, Christians. We will no longer stay silent, and we will no longer sit around in, a, in the safety of our homes. Can I get an amen? amen. Justin Moon um, was born on July 17th, 1970 is a Korean American businessman and CEO of Car Farm Group. He is the son of Sun Myung Moon, the founder of the Unification Church. He is the founder and owner of Car Arms Group, an American arms manufacturer. 
Let's hear it for Justin Moon. sponsor for this event in partnership with the Rod of Iron Ministry. Today, our God-given rights of sovereignty are being threatened by runaway correct political correctness and, and an overreaching and overbearing government regulation. We see, we see words being banned. We see people's rights to due process being taken away by red flag laws. It is for this reason that we Americans who love liberty and cherish our rights gather here today to celebrate God's given inalienable rights. We say to those people who want to take our guns, no. Hell no. Hell, hell no. <laughs> if you want to take our guns, come and take it from our cold dead hands, as Charleston Heston so eloquently stated. The framers understood well that the greatest threat to liberty and the pursuit of happiness was and still is a tyrannical government. The 20th century was born witness to the democidal inclinations of overgrown governments, imperialism, communism, nationalism, and national socialism, which have murdered over 260 million people in the last 100 years during times of peace. In the same 100 years, only 25 million people were killed by criminals. The truth is you're 10 times more likely to be murdered by your own government than you are by a criminal. Hey, that's exactly why we need the Second Amendment. I would like to thank our veterans for their service. Well, I want to give a special shout out to the veterans of the Vietnam and Korean War. Thank you guys for killing commies. <laughs> my, father spent the three, my father spent three years in the North Korean communist death camp until he was liberate, liberated by General Douglas MacArthur and the U.S. Armed Forces. If it wasn't for our servicemen killing those goddamn communists, I wouldn't be here today. So. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for killing commies. <laughs> Having experienced the horrors of communism, my father understood well the need to have arms, and he was one of the early founders of the South Korean small arms industry and defense industry. He also fathered conservative alternative media here in the U.S. as the founder of the Washington Times. My father knew that freedom existed because good God-believing people had guns until his last day on this earth, he supported the Second Amendment. Yet today in America, nearly half the millennials identify as socialists. We have not taught our children the hard-earned lessons of history. Venezuela, 20 years ago, was one of the wealthiest nations in South America and enjoyed many of the same freedoms that we have here today. Today, Venezuela is in societal collapse because of the free spending and corrupt policies of Hugo Chavez's socialist government. People are starving and being killed on the streets. The government has become predatory and the people are unable to resist and defend themselves because the government confiscated their guns. We should learn the lessons of history. We should return to the wisdom of our framers. We should reject the calls for more government and socialism. We need guns because governments and criminals are far too willing to oppress those who have no means to defend themselves. For me, the choice is clear. I stand with the Second Amendment and freedom as my father did. What part of shall not a fringe do you not understand? God bless the USA and have a fun day celebrating freedom. Thank you.
Okay, up next we have um, Alan Gottlieb. He's a founder of the Second Amendment Foundation. He's the author of numerous Second Amendment books. Alan has published articles in San Francisco Examiner, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and wow. USA Today. Let's hear it from Mr. Gottlieb. Thank you. And I really want to thank Justin Moon and Carl Arms and all the co-sponsors and all the volunteers and staff that helped put this great event on. It's the kind of things that really win our freedoms. And it's really great to be with all of you. I consider you my Second Amendment family. But more than just being family right now, you're all Second Amendment first responders. And let me tell you, it's battle stations. The war on guns has gone nuclear. I mean, it's gotten to the point that a few years ago, we were all considered deplorables. Now they call us terrorists. You know, they consider we're responsible for murders that were committed by other people. They want to take our rights away, not those other people's rights away. And the media, they're worse than they've ever been. I mean, the questions that I get from national news correspondents are just unbelievable. Uh, I mean, they're not even just biased questions anymore. They're like almost, you know, outright statements about how crazy you are because you want to own a firearm. You know, money and paid staff but on the gun grabber side is at an all-time record. Billionaires like Michael Bloomberg and George Soros have poured in hundreds of millions of dollars to attack our rights. They have more paid staff around the country lobbying for gun laws that take away our rights and our freedoms than all the gun rights groups have combined together. We are being really outgunned and outmanned. It's getting very difficult to compete with the multiple billionaires who are trying to buy away our rights and our freedom. We're being attacked in multiple ways, not just legislation, but legal actions. And it's now gotten to the point that trying to not make it possible for gun owners, gun companies, gun manufacturers to do business with banks, insurance companies, trying to zone us you know, out of existence, taxing us guns and ammunition at unbelievable record rates, social media blocks and limiting our reach so we can't re reach out to our own community and communicate. It's not just an attack on Second Amendment rights, it's an attack on our First Amendment rights. We're seeing major corporations attacking our rights. We just recently had 145 major CEOs of major corporations sign a letter urging legislators to ban firearms. What they can't ban by legislating, they're trying to do by fiat. But there is some good news. President Trump has now nominated and got confirmed well over 150 pro-gun rights judges to sit on our courts. Which also includes two U.S. Supreme Court judges. Which is extremely important because as probably most of you know, the Supreme Court has decided to hear another Second Amendment case. That case is New York City's law that does not allow people who are legally licensed to own a gun in their own home transport that gun except unloaded in a lockbox to one of seven approved gun ranges in New York City. So if you wanted to take that gun and move it to a second home in New York or go shooting on Long Island at a gun range or go upstate New York and compete in a competitive match or maybe you have a second home in Florida you'd like to move the gun to, it'd be illegal, you'd become a criminal and you'd go to jail. A federal judge in New York upheld that law the appeals court upheld it unanimously, and the U.S. Supreme Court decided to hear that case. They wouldn't have decided to hear that case if they thought that law was constitutional. New York City tried to attempt to um, moot that case by amending it and changing it, and now argued to the Supreme Court they shouldn't hear it. Well, the Supreme Court just told New York to go fly a kite because they're going to hear the case. There's also four other cases, one just followed by the Second Amendment Foundation two days ago, before the Supreme Court with cert petitions we hope get granted, uh, that be heard right after this one. So there's backed up four other cases before the US Supreme Court 
making a total of five that are sitting before the court right now to protect our rights. There's also, also other good news. Our opponents are now exposed. Peter O'Rourke did us a big favor. In fact, President Trump blamed dummy Beto for tweeting for in, in a tweet for increasing, for making it more difficult to reach any kind of agreement in Congress on gun control. His quote stated, dummy Beto made it much harder to make a deal. Convince many of the Dems that they just want to take your guns away. The president was referring to the comments O'Rourke made at the Democratic Presidential Convention in Houston, where he basically said, I'm quoting him, hell yes, we're going to take your AR-15s and your AK-47s. Never! Never! Some Democrats, none of the presidential candidates at the debate criticized O'Rourke for what he said. They all were basically in agreement. Some Democrats did criticize his remarks, not for the content or the anti-gun rights philosophy, but for the timing. Don't do it before the elections, it might hurt us at the polls. None of them support Second Amendment rights. All the Democratic presidential candidates are extreme when it comes to gun control, but they can no longer claim they're for gun safety or for common sense gun control, because now they've come out for bans and confiscation. They're now the party of confiscation. That, of course, has fired up our base. It's fired you up. It's probably the reason why some of you are here today. That's right. That's right. I just came back from speaking at two, two major conferences, the Western Conservative Political Action Conference in Reno, Nevada, and of course the Second Amendment Foundation's Gun Rights Policy Conference in Phoenix. And then look at here. Every place we go, we're getting record numbers of people, gun owners turning out to support Second Amendment rights. Our opponents may have billions of dollars, but we've got the talent and the people on the ground. The White House has contacted me six times over the last month to talk about what's going on in Congress and what their response should be. And I can tell you that President Trump will not consider bills passed by the United States House of Representatives that put in so-called universal background checks that are really universal registration systems or red flag laws that they passed without due process and protection for gun owners and Second Amendment rights. You know, the president just recently loaned, learned that they can even do impeachment without due process, which only solidified in his mind what they're trying to do to gun owners with red flag laws. Political reality is, though, we face threats that are really big, and we need to really step up our game big time. Polling data shows that most Americans support gun control laws when they don't think they're gun control, when they think they're public safety or common sense gun control or gun safety. When you give them the questions, though, on the Second Amendment, they're still just as strong in supporting gun rights as they were before the last few mass tragedies we've had in our country. We must fight to win, and to do that, we have to fight smart. Now is the time to be more active. If this is a major battleground state. As Pennsylvania goes, is how America is gonna go in the next election. Gun owners all across the country are watching what you do here in the state. It's really important that Pennsylvania goes pro-gun. We need to have a pro-gun president, and we need to have a pro-gun Congress. We need four more years of appointing pro-gun judges to the, to the courts and maybe another judge or two of the U.S. Supreme Court. You have your work cut out for you here in Pennsylvania, and every gun owner again in America is counting on you. I'm counting on you. Together, the 2020 elections is gonna solidify our gun rights for decades to come. Thank you. So the next speaker, it's awesome that he's here today. If you guys remember what happened in Benghazi, 9-11, 2012, it's an absolute disgrace what Hillary Clinton did to this country and sold out the good men and women. It's unbelievable. 
As you know, Hillary Clinton, you know, I don't dislike her because she's a Democrat, because she's a liberal or any of that. I, I don't even know what her policies are. She just sells out this country to the highest bidder, okay? And uh, John has some stuff to say about this, but I remember la uh, 2016 on 9-11, they were down at, uh, in New York, um, and Hillary Clinton was down there. You guys remember what happened? You guys remember she passed out, right? Because she sold out this country, and I think it was a disgrace that she would even show her face on that day down in New York. And I feel like it was divine. The thing about um, what John is di did in Benghazi is amazing, and he'll tell you all about it. But the other thing that I really appreciate what he did is that when he came back from Benghazi, he was so upset, and he refused to keep his mouth shut. He refused to allow Hillary Clinton and Obama to lie to the American people about what had happened that day. Okay? So here today we have John Tygan, he's a former Marine Sergeant, secret soldier from the Battle of Benghazi, co-author of the movie Consultant for 13 Hours, which was an amazing movie by the way. A motivational speaker, let's hear it for John Tygan. pre-made speech so yeah <laughs> um, thank y'all for coming out and supporting us uh, the first event of this year first hopefully got a lot more coming because obviously it's a pretty big showing I believe um, I think our biggest thing coming up in the next election is get your f friends out to vote the ones that say well my vote doesn't count those are the ones you need to get out to help make the difference because right now you got the left, they're just screaming and they're biting, they're punching. I mean, next thing you know, they're be throwing acid on us. Um, again, taking away your rights, I think right now the, the Second Amendment is more important than the First Amendment. Because the First Amendment, it's, it's, it's actually getting shunned too. Look what they're doing in California. I think it's against the law to say manhole. Or it's against the law to call an illegal alien an illegal alien. You know, it's a, what, a $250,000 fine now in New York or something like that? I mean, we're just getting stomped left and right. You know, they got, uh, what was the Capitol? They end up raising the, the communist, communist China flag up on the, in the Capitol. What was that Minnesota or something like that that did, did, did that recently? I mean, the people that are getting elected in the office is just, it's ridiculous. They're s straight up coming out that they're socialist communists. They support, you know, pretty much dictatorship. They want to take everything away. They want to control everything that we do, every pretty much from what we say to what we own, and to if, if our cows can fart. I mean, it's the politicians nowadays. They're just so emboldened. I think it's because the conservatives have been so quiet and not been seen. I think we need to reverse that. We need to be seen and we need to be heard right. on a higher number. And I think all the, the gun right community people who say they're for the Second Amendment need to get together, start working together instead of fighting each other. I see it all the time. People ask me, hey, why don't you come do this? Well, why don't you work with these guys? Ah, oh, we don't like them. You got the same freaking cause. We're being divided by ourselves. We need to band together and start working with each other. Look at the left. I mean, they're, they're coming together. They're, they're crushing our voice. So you got to really get out there and start pushing and pushing. You know, we did a, I didn't get to go, we did an event up, up there in Colorado supporting the Border Patrol where the, they tore the, the American flag down, raised up, I believe, the Mexican flag at the Border Patrol office up there. You know, we had a counter protest. I didn't get to go, but it was a lot more organized where a lot more bigger groups band together and came together that weren't really talking to each other but it made a huge difference the next time they went out there and tried to protest the Border Patrol. So again, we have to get together. We're, that's gonna protect the First Amendment and our Second Amendment. You know, obviously, what's that guy? What, what's her name? The Beto guy? Beto. Beto, yeah. I mean, he's saying, I wanna take all your, yeah, the beta male. <laughs> I wanna take all your ARs. Yeah, good luck with that. I mean, I don't know one one sheriff that I've talked to so far. He say he will even enforce that. A lot of sheriff's officers ain't even going to enforce the the red flag law because it's a, again it's it's an infringement. 
Every law passed against our guns is an infringement. It says in the Constitution, shall not be infringed. The fact that you can't even carry a gun, transport a gun, it's an infringement. It's just, I don't see how the Supreme Court even allows it to even happen. I mean, look at the First Amendment. You can say anything you want, do whatever you want, but it comes to the Second Amendment, you can't. You're getting restricted. You're getting, you can't do this, you can't do that. Now, I don't agree with everybody owning a, a tank or a Stinger cruise missile or Tomahawk cruise missile. That's just stupid, but we should have the right to own every firearm that is made. Yay! And again, the only way we're gonna get that back is if we come together, every Second Amendment pro group actually comes together and starts fighting back together. That concludes NRA fighting, joining all the other organizations. I can't, like the Gun Policy for America, they need to all come together and work together. The sad thing is they're all fighting each other for the same exact freaking thing. And it's, it's, it's hurting, it's, I mean, you see it. But I'm glad to be a domestic terrorist now because I am an NRA member, just so you know. So I went from a Benghazi hero to a Benghazi hero domestic terrorist. So I guess I'm put on my new title. But again, you know, thank you guys. Appreciate you guys coming, supporting this, uh, supporting Car and the Rada, Rada Ministry, and it's awesome. Hope to guys see you guys tomorrow when I'm doing my seminar. I think to tomorrow at one o'clock up here on this stage, which I'll tell the firsthand account of Benghazi. And again, get your friends out there to vote with you. That's how you're going to make a difference. Otherwise, we will be on the streets with our guns again. Again, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys something real quick about divide and conquer. Um, after Jesus was crucified, the Christian revolution was exploding in the Roman Empire and they didn't know what to do. Every single time, traditionally, they would just kill a leader and it would kill the revolutions, but this was different because Christians had something different. They believed in the higher cause, right? They were okay with dying because they believed in God. They believed in their purpose, okay? The sacrifice. That's why our forefathers had the courage that they did. So what they did is instead of killing the leaders, they would send philosophers into the communities. They would ask controversial questions. And, tr and what it would do is people would have different answers and they start to split up. They, they start to split up instead of being one unit. Instead of being one unit to fight for Christ and the belief of Jesus, they would focus on the differences, right? And they did that, they've been doing that ever since, okay? Whether it be with the Second Amendment community, whether it be in the Christian community, you have, to question, you have to understand that unity is the only way that we will be able to take back this country. It's the only way. Evil thrives on dividing us, ladies and gentlemen. Do not fall for it. That is why Hong Kong is so strong right now, right? Two million people, you think they're gonna have some differences? Yes, they are, but they care more about the future for their children than their differences. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Next, we have the, um, the introduction to the founder. Um, it's Pastor George Cook. Where's he at? Get up here, George. He's widely known as the Patriot <laughs> Pastor. All right. I had, I had the privilege to listen to him speak yesterday. I was blown away. A little bit controversial. Oh, you can do better than that! All right. I want everybody, I want everybody, I gotta say this slow because it's being translated. Everyone who has never been to the United States before, please raise your hand. Yeah. All you Americans, let's give them a big welcome. God bless you, we are so happy you're here. We're happy, we're, I'm ecstatic. I'm ecstatic that you're here. We love you, we love you. I love you. Now, you know, last time I got up and spoke in front of a bunch of sanctuarians, um, <sighs> carpeting, 
And Doug, he's the head of security here. He frisked me before he let me come up on the stage to make sure that I wasn't carrying any renegade carpets. But I have floor tiles. I have these, by the way, I'm gonna be introducing my beloved brother, the second king, and he's not used to standing in one place, so I figured I'd bring these so he wouldn't know where to stand. There's nothing else written on them this time, guys, sorry. One of the comments that I get an awful lot is, you're a pastor and you carry a gun? Yep! And if you've never been to a church where the pastor carries a gun, welcome! You're gonna get a belly full of it today. And if you're part of the liberal media, welcome. And you know what you call a pastor who carries a gun? Freedom fighter. You call him a pastor that doesn't have any church shootings in his church. It's very simple, right? It's, it's, it's very simple. A pastor is called to be the shepherd of his people. Shepherds protect sheep. If somebody comes bursting into your church with a gun looking to kill your sheep, do more than pray, shoot back. And just in case this makes it, you know, to the liberal media, and it will. I just want to say one thing to Joe Biden, to Beto O'Rourke, Elizabeth Warren, Pocahontas, and all the rest of them who have come out proudly to say that I'm going to have to give up my AR-15 and my AK-47 and my other AR-15 and other stuff. I just want to tell you two things. The bad news is, when you come to get that rifle, the barrel is going to be damned hot. And the good news is, dead bodies are easier to drag out over spent brass. Yes. And you know I'm telling the truth, right? Because everybody who knows me is like, Pastor George is a maniac. Just incidentally, and I, I do have the privilege, and I, I'm gonna do this right now, of introducing a man who has become very special to me. A year and a half ago, I didn't know him. Now, apparently, I'm a Mooney. I'm, I'm, like the, I'm, I'm like, my wife goes, are you a member of that church? They don't have members here. We have supporters. God gave me, God gave me a word the first time I ever met him. He said, protect him. Support him. I didn't know why then. I kind of know why now. So I struggled for the last eight weeks to find some words to say about a man who is so precious, who is so good, who is so humble. I'm gonna quote, the doctrines of Jesus are simple and tend to the happiness of man. The practice of morality being necessary for the well-being of society, he, God, has taken care to impress its precepts so indelibly on our hearts that they shall not be effaced by the subtleties of our brain. We all agree in the obligation of the moral principles of Jesus 
and nowhere will they be found delivered in greater purity than in his discourses. I am a Christian in the only sense in which he wished anyone to be, sincerely attached to his doctrines in the preference of all others. I am a real Christian, that is to say, a disciple of the doctrines of Jesus Christ. Amen. This quote by one of our famous founding fathers describes my brother. That is the side that serves Christ and is the shepherd and the beloved king. But that very same, the very same founding father said this, the laws that forbid the carrying of arms are laws of such a nature. They disarm only those who are neither inclined nor determined to commit crimes. Such laws make things worse for the assaulted and better for the assailants. They serve rather to encourage than to prevent homicides. For an unarmed man may be attacked with greater confidence than an armed man. Yeah. Thomas Jefferson. So by way of introduction, I thought about what will I say about the king? What will I say about Pastor Sean Moon? What will I say about him? Shall I tell you about his time in Harvard? Shall I tell you about his path, his walk? Shall I tell you about um, his books that he's written? Shall I tell you about the family that he's raised? Shall I tell you about his lineage? I'm going to tell you the most important thing. He is my brother. And I love him. And it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce to you Hyung Jin Nim Moon, Pastor Sean. He always makes me blush. Oh, my goodness. Please, please, folks. All glory to God. Thank you. Good morning, patriots and freedom loving people made in the image of God. We are honored and pleased to have you at the beautiful Car Arms property celebrating America, the Second Amendment, and the culture of armed, responsible citizenry. According to the Young Turks, uh, this is a fully uh, semi automatic belt fed that could uh, get you a, 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 in a thousand rounds in, in half a second. I also want to acknowledge the planning committee and all our friends and their families who made this event possible. Also, we are happy to be joined here with other freedom fighters from around the world who are fighting in their respective countries for a second amendment that we enjoy and often, often take for granted here in the United States. I'd like to give credit to all the freedom fighters in different countries that are also standing up for their natural right to self-defense. If the right to keep and bear arms is a natural right, like our framers stated, then it is a human right, and all human beings should have the right of self-defense against tyranny. We celebrate freedom this day because in 1950, my father, the Reverend Sun Myung Moon, was freed from a North Korean death camp by U.S. forces while he was imprisoned and scheduled for execution for preaching the gospel. It is good men with guns that stop bad men with guns that led to my father's freedom, with which, out, uh, which without myself or my brother would not be here today. We deeply thank God for the good people with guns that seek to defend others because you make our world safer and better. The Freedom Festival is named the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival because in the Bible, the Rod of Iron symbolizes God's reign over evil and dominion of the earth. 
rod of iron is the accoutrement that judges the wicked and the criminal classes and quote shatters the nations into pieces like the potter's vessel god's kingdom de depicts a decentralized armed society that is in the image of the chief shepherd first peter 5 and verse 4. the shepherd's hook staff is to catch and rein in his sheep from harm and the shepherd's rod is to punish the wolves and predators that seek to kill his sheep in the same way the rod of iron that is given to the believers in Christ Jesus allows the good guys to have arms to defend the sheep and to punish the wicked when needs be evil in the heart of man will always need to be warred against because God has given man free will he can choose good or he can choose evil it is for this reason that God makes his people kings to rule with him in co-heirship Romans 8 17 and collectively defends the kingdom of God from the predator class that lusts for absolute power Jesus is not the effeminate castrated Jesus that we see depicted in stained glass windows or we may have heard of in Sunday school he is a perfect man God himself in the flesh that as a loyal son and soldier gave his life for you and me and we ask that you make him the Lord of your life and be forever transformed when we think of the biblical God we may not think of arms or weapons but Jehovah God himself in Genesis is a creator of the first weapon in the Bible as he arms a cherubim to defend the east side of the Garden of Eden from fallen man and their new master Lucifer in John chapter 2 we see that Jesus is an assault weapons manufacturer he manufactures the scourge a nine tail whip with blades on the end for the express purpose of assaulting the money changers in the temple in Luke chapter 22 Jesus states to his disciples sell your cloak and buy a sword a military grade weapon which civilians could not own this is the Jesus of the founding fathers and this is the Jesus that saved and secured America from tyranny Amen. I will argue that the founding fathers of America freed us from an evil satanic king who loved big government and allowed us the citizens of America to become kings over our own lives and property and collectively be armed to protect and check and balance one another after all as the saying goes an armed society is a polite society ten reasons why the founding fathers made us kings number one historically kings differ from slaves and servants kings historically had a divine right inalienable rights and natural rights kings could own territory and have a sovereign kingdom kings could have weapons and armed forces to defend that territory historically across all cultures slaves could not own property or weapons or have rights thus the founding fathers gave us the right of kings that only monarchs and kings enjoy number two america is a judeo-christian civilization amen it's not a jihadi or islamist country it is a judeo-christian civilization in a study reviewing all american political literature from 1760 to 1805 the Bible was referenced more than any other European writer or school of thought, such as Enlightenment, liberalism, or republicanism. 98% of the founding generation were affiliated with Protestant Christianity that protested the centralized nature of the Catholic Church and or the centralized nature of governments of Europe. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, the faithful witness and the first begotten of dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth has loved us and washed us from our sins by his own blood and hath made us kings and priests revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 the bible says we are heirs with god and co-heirs 
with Christ, the creator of the universe. Romans 8 and 17. The Bible scripture states, we shall rule the nations with the rod of iron and dash them to pieces as a potter's vessel in Psalms 2. Thus, the experiment in self-government and rulership begins with the Judeo-Christian ethic of following the ideal man, Jesus Christ, and governing and ruling ourselves first. Yeah. Number three, in America, government must serve the people, not vice versa. Yeah. Government officials are to be public servants, not public masters. There is to be one set of laws for all. We the people choose our leaders and should have the power to dethrone them as well. We are not a democracy. James Madison stated that democracies have ever been spectacles of turbulence and contention, have ever been incompatible with personal security or the rights of property, and have in general been as short in their lives as they have been violent in their deaths. John Adams wrote that democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There was never a democracy yet that did not commit suicide, end quote. Thomas Jefferson stated that a democracy is nothing more than mob rule, where 51% of the people may take away the rights of the other 49. Number four, in America, we are a republic which has an electoral college, which ensures that individuals elected to the presidency don't only have the support of the population heavy coast, but broad support throughout the entire country. We also have a Senate where each state is represented equally, irrespective of population size or prestige. We also have a Supreme Court where the court's members are given lifetime appointments by presidents elected via the Electoral College, not the general voters, and are subject to no democratic oversight or elections. Thus, these checks and balances help protect our sovereign rights as citizens and as kings. Number five, in America, like a king, we are innocent until proven guilty by a jury of our peers. In the 18th century, Sir William Blackstone wrote, the truth of every accusation must be confirmed by the unanimous suffrage of 12 of his equals and neighbors indifferently chosen and superior to all suspicion. Entrusting plenary powers over the life and liberty of a citizen to one judge or a group of judges is dangerous. Community participation in the determination of guilt and or innocence is essential to our criminal justice system. This was to protect the citizens from false accusations or political targeting. Number six, in America, like a king, we own ourselves and we own our labor. We are not the property of the state. Our founding fathers adored the writings of English theologian and political theorist John Locke. Thomas Jefferson stated that Locke was among the trinity of greatest men the world had ever produced. John Quincy Adams pronounced that the Declaration of Independence was founded on one and the same theory of government expounded in the writings of Locke. John Locke, the theologian, argued that we human beings in a state of nature own our own bodies and thus own the fruits of our labors produced by our bodies. These fruits of our labors become our private property as they would have remained unused and unaccessed parts, parts of nature. Thus, private property is a right derived from our labor and is not a right given to us by bureaucracy or government. Private property is not a social convention. It is a natural right required for survival. Subsequently, in America, we did not have all these government taxes, which was seen as a forcible theft of our labor because we own our bodies that produce the resources that are stolen forcibly by taxation. In America, there was no income tax until 1913. For 137 years, Americans kept what they made. Number seven, in America, like a king, we have the freedom to interact and transact with whom we choose. 
Economic interaction must not be based on coercion, i.e. taxes or monopolies colluding with government. In other countries, like our ethnicity, we're from North Korea, freed uh, uh, and by the U.S. troops, and our family was able to survive and get to America. Economic, uh, in other countries, government has total control of economic realities, like production, money supply, interest rates, etc. Before the Federal Reserve Act of 1914, the U.S. enjoyed the world's most free economic arrangement, where governments did not pick and choose winners, but rather individual customers determined winners. The customer is king. We heard that many times in our, in, in our growing up. Freedom in the markets is essential for a moral society, as it does not use force to initiate trade. And it allows people to earn their happiness and success. Trade is done in a mutually beneficial manner, and in the end, the competition of producers makes for higher quality and lower priced goods and services. So like kings, we have the freedom to transact with whom we choose. In North Korea, you don't have that, folks. Or neither in China. In America, the citizens, number eight, in America, the citizens have more guns than the government. In other parts of the world, government has the majority of guns. Guns are a tool of power. Mao Zedong stated that all political power comes from the barrel of a gun. Communists and those who believe in government like a religion know that they must monopolize the use of deadly force to coerce people to obey their tariffs, taxes, and unconstitutional laws. The Second Amendment allows for citizens to have a last means of defense, not to hunt or recreationally shoot, but to throw off a tyrannical government by being able to organize and create local militias and citizen armed forces. The Second Amendment states that a well-regulated militia being necessary for a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This right to armaments is the ability to organize in groups as capable armed citizens. It is a right that only kings enjoyed historically. There is no other country in the world with such an armed civilian class. In America, the citizen is a sovereign individual, like a king, that can protect his kingdom and collectively with other citizen kings can protect the country from enemies foreign and domestic. Number nine, in America we have castle doctrine, where the citizen is legally a king that can defend his castle. Despite the retreat laws that have encroached onto the books, originally the law saw a citizen as a king, and he had the right to his private property and thus had a right to defend his castle with deadly force if that is the only way to stop an onslaught or violent takeover of his castle. Although we Americans are not accustomed to thinking of ourselves as citizen kings, the Bible and founding fathers outlined rights that only kings could have. Number 10, in America, God gives us our rights, not government. Thomas Jefferson submitted for use on the seal of the United States the phrase, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. America protested, put, I'm sorry, protected the natural rights that a loving father, creator God, bestowed upon his children. God gave dominion of the world to his children, not Lucifer in the Garden of Eden. The ideal of God's creation is that his children be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion over the earth. The Bible speaks of the right of believers in Christ to also rule the angels and the nations in a pomino rule or shepherd-like rule. But right now our country is in tremendous chaos and under attack. The radical leftists are treasonously indoctrinating our children into communism. They are trying to impeach a duly elected president for crimes they committed and are trying to upturn our nation's connection to Jesus and Judeo-Christian ethics. 
and place us under the rule of global governance, ruled by the elites of the world, the UN, uh, radical Islam, communist China, you name it. If we do not awaken to our sovereignty and godly kingship, this nation and the world will fall into the hands of the wicked and darkness will rule over this world. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is the great shepherd that will empower his flock to become shepherds made in his image, to reign with him and rule the nations with the rod of iron, to free those who are oppressed by sin and by Satan, and to liberate slaves to become kings for his glory. Welcome to the Rod of Iron Freedom Festival, folks. God bless you and God bless America.